Welcome to another edition of Weekly Digest, a government information agency program that keeps you informed on what the administration has been doing that will create a better environment for citizens. I'm your host, Janelle Carter. Thank you for joining us. In this week's presentation for the period August 2nd through 8th, 2014, Speaker's ruling exposes his lack of impartiality, government says, of move to have AFC members brought before Privileges Committee. Another expression of confidence in the economy as new banquet hall opens in Linden. And West Demerara Hospital gets new neonatal unit as government seeks to reduce infant mortality. Presidential Advisor on Governance Gail Teixeira believes that the ruling by the Speaker of the National Assembly, Raphael Trotman, not to send Alliance for Change members of Parliament before the Privileges Committee is not surprising and demonstrates the Speaker's lack of objectivity. The Shearer had written to the Speaker citing reasons why the Alliance for Change members, Kathy Hughes and Kemraj Ramjatan, should be placed before the Privileges Committee. In her letter to the Speaker, she pointed out that after Ramjatan's client lost out in the bidding process for a specialty hospital project, he voted against the project in 2013 and again during the consideration of the estimates for the 2014 national budget. In the matter of Mrs. Hughes, it was noted that she was handling the public relations for Site Global and at no point did she publicly declare her position that she was benefiting from such arrangement and her voting pattern in relation to the Myla Falls project. In both instances, the Speaker ruled that the prima facie case could not be made out against two members. I am not surprised. I'm absolutely not surprised by the Speaker's ruling. These are his party members, and I have said, I think, to Stabrick News, I didn't notice they quoted from me, but I'll repeat it again for who would like to quote it, and that is I'd like to quote Martin Carter, in that the mouth is muzzled by the hand that feeds it. The presidential advisor added that when she penned the letter, she strongly believed, and she still believes, that there was a case that could be made out that an MP had not been honorable. Both Guyanese and foreign investors continue to express confidence in the economy. Local investors are now found in every region as they diversify their services and products. One of the latest local investments opened its doors in Region 10. Prime Minister Samuel Hines, who commissioned the building, said the initiative also bears evidence that Linden is progressing and is on par with other parts of the country in terms of development. The Prime Minister noted that as a government, working to improve standards of living in the country is a priority and will always be the end point to which the administration works. An event such as this shows that someone has made a judgment and has made an investment to in seeing that Linden is advancing and progressing and maybe not too far behind Georgetown. So some of you may know that maybe four or five years ago that uh, similar establishment has been put into Georgetown in, in the breakdown area. So Linden is not far behind Georgetown and that, that brings me Great the banquet hall has been deemed by the Prime Minister as a good example of development for the mining town and one which reflects positively on the country's economy. Acknowledging the fact that Linden has had its share of challenges like the rest of the country, he noted that the community has withstood the tests and continued to progress. The fourth session of the Presidential Commission set up to find out who or what was responsible for the death of Guyanese historian Dr. Walter Rodney continued early August, with more witnesses completing their evidence. Takuma Ogunseya and Karen D'Souza, both of the Working People's Alliance Party, maintained their opinions that the late Dr. Walter Rodney was killed by the state. Both witnesses reiterated that Dr. Rodney, and by extension the WPA, was the biggest political opposition to the PNC government of the day. A vindictive person could do anything. <coughs> but I don't see the relevance. And I will repeat, a person could be vindictive and they could do good things and they could do bad things. They could do anything. Meanwhile, Crime Chief Leslie James also gave testimony regarding files relating to the surveillance of WPA and its members. The files revealed that both the WPA and the People's Progressive Party were under observation by the police. In this case, we're looking at PF personal file, personal file 7 to 3. Yes. So there was in existence, according to this report, 
a personal file number 73 in relation to Dr. Walter Rodney. It suggests that, yes. While seven files in relation to the police surveillance of WP activities remain missing, the Commission also revealed from one of the documents presented that there was also a personal file on Dr. Walter Rodney, which is also missing. However, the crime chief could not see what happened to those files, stating that persons at Special Branch could not give any explanation for the missing files. Residents and visitors can soon expect a cleaner Georgetown as the massive cleanup exercise is on the way in several areas. Work in other areas will commence soon as more contractors will be coming on board. Lerapentere Cemetery, All Boys Town and Church Street Canal are areas where work is ongoing. Those areas were recently visited by Minister of Local Government and Regional Development, Norman Whitaker, along with Member of Parliament, Manzur Nadir, Town Clerk Acting, Carol Soba, City Engineer Acting, Ron Eastman and other officials. Contractors have started drainage works at Lerapentere Cemetery but are hindered as there are high water levels. The work is estimated to be completed at the end of September. We also took the prison's officer to see the work that has to be done in terms of vegetation in the cemetery area because that work is massive, it's been divided into a number of lots and uh, we have asked the prison authorities to assist with the cleaning up of one lot and that will mean providing some of the inmates of the Georgetown prison to assist in that excitement. Workers who were involved in cleaning the drains in All Boys Town noted it was no easy task. However, since they are optimistic about their work, the ministry has been encouraging and assisting with safety gears to ensure that they can conclude the works. The cleanup for the Church Street Canal is almost completed and soon work will commence at the Lamaha Canal. We have some issues that were raised with respect to GWI's contribution to the silting up here and we will engage the GWI in some discussions on that, how they could reduce the impact or how they can make a contribution towards us taking care of that. The government of Guyana has allocated $1 billion in its 2014 budget for a Clean Up My Country program with an allocation of $500 million for Georgetown. Stay tuned, more of the Weekly Digest after the break. Ghana's tourism sector is definitely on the rise. In fact, even in a fledgling stage, it can still rival those of the Caribbean. Now, with an investment of $800 million for the establishment of a hospitality institute, the country is poised to receive even more international recognition. Parents with school-aged children will achieve a measure of relief with a provision of $10,000 per school year for all school children in the public schools. This from the 2014 budget is in addition to the school uniform voucher, which will continue to be distributed. The provision of $1 billion via the national budget for the execution of cleaning and sanitation works in the nation's municipalities is an indication of government's commitment towards providing a healthy environment and keeping its citizens safe from various diseases spread by insanitary conditions. Half of this amount will be used to clean the capital city of Georgetown and begin the process of restoring it to its former status of the Garden City. You're watching the Weekly Digest. To ensure that the operation of Gaisuku's new board is not in any way delayed, the government is moving ahead with the orientation process of the identified individuals who have since confirmed their willingness to serve on the board and whose appointment the cabinet has approved. We had been awaiting the waiting word from three persons. Um, one that everybody knew of, um, the Mr. Komal Chan of Gao. Mr. Chan has since um, not accepted our invitation to serve on the board. One of the two other persons that the government has been waiting on has since given his verbal approval, while the second has requested more time to consider his decision. If and when he agrees, he will so be added to the board which has already been kicked into gear. We do not want to delay the operations of the board. In the meantime, the new members are um, being engaged by Guy Suko in terms of um, status report, etc. And therefore, engagement such as we had in Parliament with the 
economic service committee we are having with these board members so that they are up to date they have all the latest information in terms of um, the operations of Gaisuko. At this time, Gaisuko is operating at all eight estates and all seven factories are presently grinding, including Skeldon. Some of the estates, such as the Blair Mont and Rose Alkanji estates, have been performing creditably, with workers earning extra days' wages for production. This is seen as a promising start for the second grinding season. Thousands of Guyanese have been empowered through the One Laptop of Family program as the technological devices have been assisting in their education and upliftment. But while some are technologically advanced, others continue to receive their laptops. On August 3, 2014, residents of Region 5 in the Hyde Park area became proud owners of ETA laptops, which is an ongoing pursuit that will benefit 90,000 Guyanese all across Guyana. Residents waited patiently as they received their laptop, and a few of them even expressed their gratitude towards the government. I'm here to receive my laptop for my family, which I'm grateful for, and I'm so thankful to the government for its effort, being a mom, parent of two, you know, I can be able to assist my kids at home in their homework, not having to go to the internet and pay, you know, which will add more expense to the family. So I'm very grateful today for what the government is doing in our community. I am so happy in getting this laptop because I am mining four grandchildren without a father and a mother. And I am a widow, and I am very, very happy about it because my grandchildren may get benefit of it. Thank you. I was hoping um, I would get one, so I would learn from it also. And I have one child left going to school, and hoping she would benefit from it. Because three already finished school, and they didn't get to use it. Government continues to work through its OLPF initiative to ensure that every Guyanese become imbued with information communication technology skills to contribute to the socio-economic development of themselves and Guyana as a whole. For many years, infant mortality and maternal deaths have been a major issue not only in Guyana but the world at large. To eradicate this problem in Guyana, the Ministry of Health has been ensuring that adequate neonatal units are installed at all major hospitals. The establishment of this unit is part of a project set up by Guyana Help the Kids, a registered Canadian charity, to ensure safer deliveries for mothers, a healthier childhood for babies, and to reduce and hopefully end child mortality in the country. This is the fourth such unit and is fully equipped with incubators, open care warmers, infant ventilators, CPAP machines, IV pumps, syringe pumps, phototherapy lamps, LED and fluorescent, monitors, transport incubator, oxygen and humidity therapy devices, aerosol medication devices, along with many other machinery to ensure safer childhood for neonatals. One of the nice things about this room is it's very light, so there's a lot of windows and a lot of sunlight, and that's one thing that babies really need, and so um, that's one of the really nice things about this particular space. And it has a nice amount of space for babies, so it has room for five babies to be here if they need to be. Um, and will be able to be treated with oxygen and warmth and IV fluid as they need. So that will be a big thing in trying to advance neonatal care here at West Ham Regional Hospital. The project targets the five main hospitals, Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation, New Amsterdam, Linden, West Demerara and Sudi Hospitals, because a survey conducted showed that they account for 85% of newborns in the country. This is the fourth such unit to be commissioned. It is truly a milestone today that we're here opening up four out of five neonatal intensive care units in the country. It is a special day for me and many members of our team who, are, who have traveled long distances to be here because they've not only been part, they've been part of our program for quite some time. And to see a unit like this come to fruition is truly an achievement and uh, not only a professional achievement, but certainly a personal achievement from our point of view. The service was first introduced at the GPHC with the establishment of a 24-bed level NICU. Then the latter moved to the New Amsterdam and Linden hospitals. 
Stay tuned, more of the Weekly Digest after the break. Ghana is set to achieve the goal set by the United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF of universal birth registration by 2050. The General Register Office has launched an intensive campaign. It has decentralized its services to specifically cater to the needs of residents living in the interior location. Bedside registration is also done in several public hospitals. There are now 200 registration centers operating in the 10 regions. Citizens are urged to ensure that all births are registered. The modernization of the Justice Administration System, the MJAS project, has been completed through a loan from the Inter-American Development Bank. Achievements made under the project include amended and new laws, training for personnel within the sector, reduction of the severe case backlog, the refurbishing of courts, increased numbers of judicial officers and training, publication of law reports and their indices online, the establishment of a DPP office in Burbies, computerization of several connected systems, among other aspects. During Cabinet's statutory meeting at the Office of the President on August 5th, several issues of national concern were discussed. The media was subsequently briefed on Cabinet's deliberations. At its August 5th statutory meeting, Cabinet gave its no objections to 10 contracts in the areas of education, solid waste management, agriculture, security, housing and water, and infrastructure. In keeping with the government's thrust to promote development in hinterland villages, the councils of titled Amerindian villages can now have the opportunity to tender for contracts being awarded in their communities. Programs that have been and are currently being implemented, empowered and have been empowering residents in these communities, in both the productive and in the service sectors, in the regional and in the national economy. Sustainability was continuously addressed and its main focus for the administration has been the continued access to public funding by the residents of the hinterland communities to capital goods. The Ministry of Local Government and Regional Development will be tasked with overseeing this process. Payment for services rendered, their contributions to building in the productive sector, and their contributions to service delivery in the service sector, sowing, food production, and its sale to the local system in education and such like. As the Parliament goes into recess on August 10, the convening of the usual sitting to close off the session is highly unlikely. Bills that are at the House Bills that are in special select committees, motions, and all such matters that are on the order paper and being actively considered. Importantly, telecommunications, Importantly, money laundering. It would be not wise for us to contemplate this hiatus from August the 10th to October the 10th without mentioning what these consequences of what are obtained as a consequence. Meanwhile, the HPS said that the ruling of the Speaker to not have AFC members Kati Yuz and Kemraj Ramjitan appear before the Privileges Committee could be subject to a judicial review. Were possibilities to exist for challenges that challenges can be expected to be made. 
I will, however, observe that the speaker's ruling deals uniquely with a parliamentary, a specifically with a parliamentary subject. And the remedy usually sought when challenges are made to the court, the high court, for judicial reviews, and there seems to be evolving a notion that some aspects, some aspects, the HBS said that the question as to whether or not certain authorities are given a preserve that isolates them from constitutional provisions and the law is one of the basis on which the decision will eventually be taken with regards to challenging the Speaker's ruling. Since 2011, the PPPC government has been a minority government, meaning that the PPPC government does not have a majority in parliament. In fact, the combined opposition, APNU and AFC, have a one-seat majority in parliament. APNU and AFC frequently flex their muscles because of this majority of one. But APNU and AFC, as the combined opposition, should not formulate policy and should not pressurize the government to act against its will. APNU and AFC are the opposition parties in Parliament. APNU and AFC are not the government. Despite its minority status, the PVPC government has some advantages. Let us look at these advantages. One, only one party controls the PPPC, which is the PPPC. Two, the PBPC has demonstrated strong policy consistency. Just look at its record of capital projects, which have been constantly torpedoed by APNU and AFC. Some of these capital projects are the Cherry Jagan Airport Modernization Project, Ogle Aerodrome Assistance, Civil Aviation Equipment and Hinterland Coastal Airstrips, the Specialist Hospital, and the Amila Hydropower Project. And the third advantage the PVPC government has, despite its minority status, is that it makes policy decisions in a timely manner so that policy benefits can reach the people quickly. But the opposition, APNU and AFC, have combined resources in Parliament to thwart benefits reaching ordinary people vis-a-vis -vis delaying and blocking government's major capital projects. And this new power that APNU and AFC have in Parliament requires that they act responsibly and not merely to oppose for the sake of opposing. Currently, APNU and AFC are engaged in some grand standing exercises to signal that they are united in bringing the PBPC government down. This they intend to do through presenting and passing in Parliament the AFC initiated no confidence motion against the PBPC government. The opposition APNU and AFC can make this happen through their one seat majority. However, the question people should ask is what took APNU so long to decide on whether it would support the AFC's no-confidence motion. Given that APNU was aware of this motion long before the PNC's 18th Biennial Congress last month, APNU had sufficient time prior to this PNC's Biennial Congress to pronounce on the AFC's no-confidence proposal, and APNU did not take that course. Meanwhile, the blatant undemocratic practices imposed on the PNC delegates at that Congress produced bitterness and deep divisions within the PNC. And so for APNU to now say, after the chaos at its Congress, that it supports the no-confidence proposal, 
is its way of distracting ordinary Guyanese and indeed PNC members and supporters from focusing on the mayhem and the disunity that occurred at the PNC Congress. It is hardly likely that APNU would advance the no confidence motion, given all that we know about what happened at the Congress and all the other circumstances that are involved. APNU and AFC's constant disruptive actions in Parliament to limit the PPPC's government legislative agenda will surely challenge them at any election. I thank you very much. And with those features, we have come to the end of this edition of Weekly Digest. But before we go, here's a recap of the highlights. Speaker's ruling exposes his lack of impartiality, government says, of move to have AFC members brought before Privileges Committee. Another expression of confidence in the economy as new banquet hall opens in Linden. And West Demerara Hospital gets new neonatal unit as government seeks to reduce infant mortality. Please note that the Weekly Digest and other government information can be found on our website, www.gina.gov.gy, or you can send us your comments and suggestions at ginagovgy at gmail.com. Join us again next week as we highlight more of government's programs and policies which are enhancing the lives of Guyanese. I'm Janelle Carter. Do have a safe week ahead. Goodbye.